Welcome back to 8701. Uh, in this lecture, we talk about CP symmetry or CP violation. In previous lectures, we discussed that the weak interaction is not invariant under parity and charge conjugation transformation. But now we can ask the question, how about CP? So a transformation which does charge conjugation and parity transformation. So the classical example to show parity violation is the decay of a pion. So we have here this um, charged pion with spin zero and it decays into a muon and a neutrino, an anti-muon and a neutrino. And so since the neutrino is left-handed, the out of the decay coming anti-muon needs to be left-handed as well. So if you do a parity transformation of this decay, you see that the outcoming muon would be right-handed. On the other hand, there is no right-handed neutrino, and therefore this decay is not possible. So this is not, so this mirror symmetry is not realized in nature as a consequence of the weak interaction. So similarly, you could do a charge transformation, a charge conjugation <coughs> of this decay. So you turn particles into the antiparticles, and you find here this antineutrino, which is left-handed, and also those two not exist in nature. So parity or charge conjugation doesn't really work on those decays, those weak decays. But what does work if you apply the parity and charge conjugation together, so you turn the um, positively charged pion into a negatively charged pion, the antimuon into a muon, and the neutrino into an antineutrino. And you see here that the antineutrino is right-handed. Um, so is the, the muon. And so that decay is actually observed in, in nature. Good. So we saved the day. Uh, you know, it seems like that CP, uh, that the weak interaction is invariant under CP transformation. However, that's not quite true. Um, Gelman and Pace noted that <coughs> in systems of neutral kaons, there is an odd effect. And the effect is that a particle, a K knot, can turn into an antiparticle um, by changing the strangeness. And that's possible in these kind of um, uh, box diagrams, which include you know, a box with a couple of Ws. Um, <clears throat> and it, you know, it's easy to see that you know, if you prepare, uh, prepare uh, you know, a, a K on, it will oscillate because those diagrams are possible into an antiparticle. So now what is happening now to CP here? <coughs> if I apply CP on a K on, I find a minus sign and an anti -K on. So if you want to analyze this further, you might want to find the eigenstates to this. And so the eigenstates can be found as those K1 and K2, which are admixtures of the K0 and the anti K0. And you find this symmetric, the symmetric and the anti-symmetric states. Good. So if you apply CP on the eigen um, states, you find eigenvalues of one and minus one. It turns out that the lifetime of the K1 and the K2, those eigenstates, um, is very different. You know, one is 10 to the minus 10 and one is five times 10 to the minus eight. So the K1 decays much, much quicker than the K2. So this then sets the stage to a test of CP violation. So what you want to do is prepare a beam of K, K zeros and let them decay. Um, and only after some time you study the beam again, um, which then should be uh, made up solely of K2s. So if you in that beam observe decays of the K2 into two pions, you noted that there is an admixture again, um, which violates CP. So you have an admixture of K1s in, in, a, in a beam, which should just be of K2s. Uh, so that mixture then will uh, violate CP invariance. And exactly that was done. Um, so Croning and Fitch picked up this idea. They set up an experiment in which they produced kaons, they had them decay, and then they studied later in the beam whether or not they could find two pion decays. And they did indeed observe 42 or 45 pion decays, two pion decays, in a total of 22,700 decays. 
So that means that this K long beam, the long lived K on beam, is actually an admixture of K2s with a small additional component of K1s. So here they observed um, CP violation through the mixture of those states. And this epsilon gives you a, you know, a size of the strength of the CP violation. Um, so here is a, a note of the paper. We'll have another discussion of this in class by a student presentation. Um, Croning and Fitch here. This is Croning, this is Fitch. Uh, it turns out that um, you know, Croning is actually a student or was a student of Enrico Fermi and also worked in Chicago. Uh, so there's quite an interesting family tree here uh, to which also um, Jerry Friedman belongs. Uh, Jerry Friedman is a retired uh, faculty at MIT and discovered that protons are made out of quarks. So this is a very interesting family tree. If you have some time, you might want to look into this. So here's the experiment. So you take protons, you dump them into a beam, you try to, with this, um, this magnet filter out the neutral component, uh, get rid of all photons, and then let this beam decay. Uh, and look in the spectrometer uh, for decays of two photons. Here's a bigger picture of the same spectrometer. So this is basically a blow-up view of this. Uh, so you have your your kaons, the neutral kaons coming in, the K2s, and then you look for two pi on decays. Uh, the instrumentation and how we actually would do this is part of later discussion where we actually talk about detectors in more detail. All right, <clears throat> so we just saw that Cronin and Fitch observed CP violation in mixture of states, um, but we can also observe CP violation in direct decays. And the classical example here is the case of the K-long and semileptonic decays. So semileptonic here means we have a decay of the K-long, the neutral particle in a charged pion, an electron, and an antineutrino, or it might very well also decay into a pi minus, a positron, and a neutrino. And it turns out when you really count those events <coughs> and perform a precise experiment, that the K-longs prefer decays to positrons over decays to electrons. And so the fractional amount of this you know, imbalance is three times 10 to the minus three. So this is a rather small effect again of CP violation here in direct decays. Um, since then, CP violation has also been shown in the decay of B mesons and the program of studying B mesons is a big part of the LHC experiment at the LHC. At the LHC. Um, there's also experiments in Japan going on right now which study B mesons in, in order to learn further about uh, B systems. Uh, tests are also on the way for those who listen to the colloquium on Monday in the neutrino sector. So here we have a completely different part, so not quarks are involved in weak interaction, but neutrinos. And so the question is whether or not in that sector of physics, um, in that sector of the standard model, the SCP violation. Those are aspects we'll discuss later on when we talk about neutrinos specifically. Um, before I close, uh, a few more remarks on um, uh, the matter-antimatter symmetry. So one of the biggest uh, mysteries in physics, I would claim, is the fact that we are even here to ask this question. Um, so there is apparently more matter in the universe than antimatter. If you start from a Big Bang, there was this symmetry, and now we live in a universe which is dominated by matter. So how is this possible? So in uh, 1967, Sakharov proposed that this is possible in a system where baryon number is violated. So this is almost a trivial statement. If you start from an equal number of baryons and antibaryons, the sum is then zero. Uh, the baryon number is zero of this system and you end up in a system which is dominated by baryons, then baryon number needs to be violated. But there's also the need of CP violation in this. So <coughs> we just saw that this is realized in nature, but the amount of CP violation we observe in this system I just discussed, is not sufficient to explain the meta anti meta symmetry we observe in nature. So there is more to be found. There's new physics to be looked for um, in, in, in CP violation or in this overall question. And there's also a need for um, the actions to be out of equilibrium, meaning that you don't 
you know, revert the processes as you go forward. Um, yet another point of discussion, which I will not go into much detail in this lecture, is that, you know, our quantum field theory, which describes, calls the standard model and describes the interaction of particles, is invariant under uh, CPT transformations. That means that if CP is violated, time reversal cannot uh, be a symmetry. So meaning going backwards and forward in time is not symmetric. Um, and you can test this. You can design uh, experiments which test the effect, the effect. You can also design experiments which test CPT directly. So this is those are all interesting questions, but we will not go into any of those in this in this lecture further on. Um, we will, however, come back to understanding the origin of CP violation in the standard model when we talk in more detail about um, the weak interaction. <clears throat> 